Let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for bringing us here on a Wednesday night. You know, it's a little windy out there and uh, we're maybe drizzling a little bit. Uh, but we thank you, even even the rain. We um, Taiwan needs rain and, and rain are a blessing also. So, Lord, may you just be with us right now. I just pray that you calm our hearts. You know, it's uh, middle of the week and there's probably a lot of things going on with life. But at this time, this next hour, will you just help us to just uh, calm our minds, calm our hearts, and help us to just uh, soak in your word and your living word as we study the book of Ruth. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today is one of my favorite books. Um, it's Ruth. And, you know, um, we just finished Judges. How many, how many of you, is, it's the first time that you went through the book of Judges? First time. Any, anybody had judges before? Or this is the first time going through it? But um, it's, it's a good, well, you guys are all good. <laughs> because it's, you know, if you didn't go over it, you never knew what the world was like when it's, it's every man was for himself. And there's pretty much anarchy. And today, you know, if you think about it, um, even though we have governments and all that, and, um, and we're thankful for them, but a lot of thinking today is every man for himself. It means that, you know, I believe what I, you know, what I think is right and, and what I believe is right, and I'm just going to hold on to what I think is right, and you believe what you think is right. And so it's all these things, all these think, thinkings that there's no moral absolutes. And this, that was the, um, the time period that we just left. But Ruth, Ruth was still in that time period. But you know something? Even though everything is kind of dark and there's no you know, rule, rule of law, but God is still under control. And God is still working, even though we don't see it. Even though sometimes we just, you know, where is God? Why does He allow this? But God is still working, and so that's um, that's something that we want to um, remember as we go through this book. All right, Ruth, chapter one, verse one. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. You know, sometimes, so we just, we just um, confirm that this was during the time of the judges. <clears throat> it's when they ruled. But there was famine in the land. And sometimes the Lord will bring famine into your life for judgment, for certain things that, that that either we're doing or this whole um, the people of the area is doing, the country is doing, there may be famine and the Lord uses famine for his purposes. And a, a lot of it is for to tell people to hey, get your act together, turn back, turn to me because we just go on, off, go on our own way. So there was famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, remember Bethlehem, uh, you guys know what that means? Bethlehem means house of bread. It's kind of cool. And, and Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and he, was, he is the bread of life, right? So Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. Elimelech means um, my God is king, and Naomi, Naomi means pleasant. And the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Chilion. 
Malone, you know, this, the name is kind of not so good, it means sick. And Chilion, it means uh, pining. Pining is, is basically is declining physically and mentally into despair. So why would, why would parents name their two kids, two sons, sick and pining? You know, back then, these people would name their children based on the situation. And so, if you remember, um, Jacob, you remember his two sons? Um, no, it's uh, Jacob's brother, Enoch, right? Enoch. Esau. I think, yeah, Esau. If I remember, right. Esau. Do you know, remember what his name was? What his name means? Red. Esau? Red. Red and hairy. He, in fact, it's more hairy than red. It's, he was red for sure, but he was hairy. He came out just really hairy. And Esau, so they named him Esau because of what he was. And Jacob, Remember what he did when he came out of the womb? Because they were fighting in the womb and he was holding on. They're fighting and Harry came out first and Jacob was holding on to his heel. So they, they called Jacob Jacob, which means heel catcher. So they named this Naomi and Elimelech named their sons Malone and Chilion, it's because of they were not very healthy, right? And so it's kind of not great names. And then um, keep going. Epaphrites of Bethlehem, Judah, they, um, that's where uh, they're from. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Verse 3, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left, and her two sons with she was left and her two sons. Verse 4, Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah. Orpah means a fawn, you know, a young deer. And then the name of the other, Ruth. And Ruth actually means beauty. So you know, Ruth must have been beautiful. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Mahlom and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So Naomi was left. I mean, think about that. Her husband's gone, and now her two sons are gone. She's left with her two daughter-in-law. Verse 6, Then she rose with her daughters-in-law, and that she might return from the country of Moab. And she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord has visited his people by giving them bread. So you think about it, there's famine everywhere. But then Naomi heard that there's bread back home and she wants to go back. Therefore, verse seven, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters in law with her and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Verse eight, and Naomi said to her two daughters in law, go return each to her mother's house, the Lord Deal kindly with you as you have dwelt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in each each in the house of her husband. And then she told her two daughter in law, said, You know, my kid your husbands, my sons, they died. My husband died. So you guys should go back home, be with your family. And may the Lord deal with you, meaning that may the Lord bless you, bless you with husbands and you can have a, a good life. Go home. And, you know, Ruth, when she said that, and she said that they dealt kindly with her. And I think about that. I think about, we hear this joke, these jokes about mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and how people don't get along and all that. And it seems to be the, you know, the reality in today's world. 
but for but for Ruth and for Orpah, they were they and Naomi were good, good together. And that tells me something about their life. That you know they had that respect and love for each other. And then we're gonna see that both of them actually wanted to stay. So she kissed them, Naomi kissed them, and she, they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, verse 10, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they're grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orba kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. You know, they must have had a wonderful relationship. I'm very fortunate. My wife and my mom are great friends. Yeah. And then I'll let you know, my first wife and my mom, they were great friends. So I'm very, very fortunate. God blessed me. And with, with wonderful people in my family. But for the norm, my, um, my prayer is that people we come in contact with, we don't have to have antagonistic relationships with families. We don't have to. And how do we do that? We do that with the love of God. We do that with the grace of God. We do that with the forgiveness of God. With all the things God has given us, we can give to others through Him. And we don't have to, you know, just be part of this mold where, you know, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law or father-in-law, son-in-law, that they have these weird relationships. We don't have to do that. And they didn't have that. They had a good relationship. You know, you think about um, relationships. There's a uh, part of the story. It starts back in Genesis. Do you guys remember one of the tribes? Oh, Judah. Judah had um, uh, went um, and had a son and married, um, his son married Tamar. Do you guys remember that story? And the son died because he was doing wicked things. And based on Jewish law, that the second son, needs to, to marry the, the sister-in-law to have a baby, uh, a male baby, so the lineage could continue. It's part of their uh, the Jewish, uh, Jewish law. And, and Judah, because his first son died, he had his second son marry the, the sister-in-law. And then but he didn't want to have a baby. So they never conceived, and he did it by choice, and the Lord struck him down. So that's two sons down. Judah had only one more son, who was very young. And Judah said, no way am I gonna give, it, give this girl, give, the, give my son to, to, to Tamar. And he would, he kind of lied to her. He said, you know, when he gets older, then we're, you know, I'll give her, give him to you so we can carry on the lineage. But he never did. So Tamar, when she figured that out, she decided to, to trick her father-in-law. So she dressed up, and this is in Genesis 38, she dressed up as a harlot, as a prostitute. She covered herself up, and she found out that her father-in-law was going to be at a certain place, and she was she was there and he thought that she's covered up. He thought she was just a prostitute. And so he proposed in terms of saying, hey, I want to give you a goat. 
you know, for for what you would do to, do for me. And she said, what's, what's your pledge? What are you gonna give me before you give me your goat? Because I don't know if you're gonna give me a goat. And one of the things he gave her was a signet ring, a signet ring. And, and then she took it, they had relationship, he left, she went home, she got pregnant. He went home and told his servant to take the goat to that place, to that prostitute, and the guy can't find the girl. So he asked around and said, where is that prostitute that's, there, that's sitting there? And they said, there's never been a prostitute there. So he went back to Judah and said, you know, we can't, I can't find her. He said, well, I'm good because I did try to give back the, give the goat uh, to her. Later on, he found out that Tamar was pregnant and he said, bring her here that she may be burned. She did something bad. So she showed him, said, the person that got me pregnant is the owner of this ring. And then that was one of the things he pledged. And then Judah said, you're more righteous than me. You're more honorable than me because I hid. And so he realized what he had done. But it was part of the law that the family has to keep the lineage on. And they had a baby. Judah never knew her again, but they had that one baby. His name was Perez. And Perez has something to do with the story as we go on. You know, God is always at work, no matter what. So you may think that today you're in this cloud, you're in this darkness, you're in this uh, despair, and we can't see what God's doing, but he's always at work, even from years and years ago. He's always at work, and he has his plan, and we're gonna find out today uh, how, how this all works out. So, uh, verse 15, and she said, uh, so Orba left, but Ruth clung to her in verse 15, and she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God my God, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything, but death parts you and me. Wow. Ruth, not even Jewish, a Moabitess. She has this heart. She made a spiritual commitment to her mother-in-law. And actually, this is a promise. And do you know, if, when we read this, what does this remind you of? It should remind you of weddings, of vows, wedding vows. You know, wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Wherever you go, I will go. Your God be my God. And then, if anything but death departs from, uh, departs, you and me, till death do we part. It's a wedding vow. And she made a spiritual commitment to her mother-in-law. And by the way, when I talk about Judah and Tam uh, Tamar, they, that, that signet ring, that, ple that pledge, that was actually the beginning of the wedding ring. That's where wedding rings came from. It's a promise. You know, people, Back then and today, people have these different ideas about you know, commitment and all that. But that ring, it signifies that pledge 
that pledge that we're going to be together till death do we part, right? Okay, verse 18. And when she saw she, that she was determined to go, to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi pleasant? Is this pleasant, Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. Mara means bitterness. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Wow. From that tone, from her answer, you can know she was really, really bitter against God for the death of her husband, for the death of her two sons. She was really bitter. She blamed God. For her circumstance but you know I want to a lot of people in life and for and I could even say myself too when tragedy happens when death happens when when cancer comes and especially when death happens we tend to just get mad at God we just tend to say that, you know, what, what are you doing, God? We get really upset. And sometimes we get really, really bitter. And Naomi was like that. Well, that's where she's at. But this tells us, especially for Christians, that we really don't understand why death happens. You know, death happened because of Adam, right, because of sin, entered the world. Before that, no death. There was, God created man without sin. There was, you know, it was just, this man was going to be there. There was no death. And then, you know, Lewis had just asked me a question earlier about um, why did God say um, not, let's not let them eat from the uh, the other tree where they're going to live forever. The reason is when sin happened, then there's death. It's not just physical death, it's spiritual death, right? It's your relationship with God is gone, but then there's also physical death, the diseases come in, everything starts to come in. People start to, to de decay and, 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 and life happens. But if God allowed um, Adam and Eve to eat of the other tree where you have eternal life, that means they'll never get salvation. They'll always be in sin because they had that sinful nature. But before sin came in, there, was, there wasn't any death. There was no death. And, and so death wasn't because God wanted us to die. It was because of sin. And all the bad things that happens in life comes from sin. So, if you think about it, when we think about death, and if it happens to our family, what happens, when we think about it, Christians, when we die, we go to heaven, where there's joy, there's no more tears, no more sorrows, where you're gonna have that, that, that that relationship with the Lord um, in a sinless world. In a world where there's just beauty unimaginable. Where eternity is gonna be is gonna be wonderful. And that's where we're going. So why do we get so mad about death? The reason is selfishness actually is because if you're here you fulfill me the Tom Cruise movie right 
And then if you're here, my life, you know, is better and I have company, I have the, and it's all about me. But we, when Christians go, they're, in, they're with Jesus. And so we're telling people to, you stay. And so it gets a little for us, for Christians, when we hear about death, especially for Christians, it's not a curse. Not a curse. It's a blessing. And the blessing is that person gets to go to heaven. Where for eternity, they don't have to suffer here anymore. They don't have to get COVID-19. They don't have to go through um, broken hearts, broken relationships, empty promises. They don't have to go through any of that anymore. They are in heaven. That's where Christians go. But we get bitter because, because actually because of selfishness. Because we want everything to be done our way and if we, if, we, if we were in charge we would mess a lot of things up we could prevent people from going to heaven mean that hey life support you know do all sorts of stuff but but for Christians we should be like that and I had to learn that myself that in fact, I'll teach this on Sunday too. You know, we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And on Sunday, you'll hear me because I'm working on, I'm still working, today's only Tuesday, but I'm working on my message. And one of the, one of the, one of the things I wanna say is that tomorrow is not guaranteed at all. You could get a phone call and the doctor gives you bad news or the end. And I think about that, and I think that, you know, how would I feel? And I think, I, I basically, I had a talk with the Lord, and said, you know, I would probably say that, you know, if it's really serious, somebody just died of pancreatic cancer. Oh, our friend's um, mom just died yesterday, or earlier today, uh, in the U.S., and, and she lasted one year. And I was thinking of my dad, lasted 10 months, pancreatic cancer, right? And, but then I think that, you know, if that was the diagnosis, uh, we get a bad news, it'll be a, it's my ticket to heaven. It's my ticket to heaven. And I'll, I think about that. So it's not a curse for Christians. It's actually, it's a blessing for Christians. And we need to think things differently. Not to think that, you know, man, I'm just so mad and you live in this depressed state where everything's dark. And this is where Naomi's at. And Naomi doesn't realize that God had a plan. Do you remember Martha and Mary when her, their brother was dying? They called Jesus and Jesus was it by the Jordan River and they live in, uh, they live about two days away near Bethel. And, and Jesus delayed another, I mean, it take, takes two days for the servant to get there to tell them the news. And Jesus delayed another two days before getting there. And so he's, minimum, was four days late. And then, and then do you remember what Martha said? He said, where, why did you come so late? Because Lazarus died already. And don't you care? I mean, what were you doing? And her attitude was blaming Jesus. It was blaming Jesus. Saying that if you were here earlier, my brother would have lived. We all have that same heart. When bad things happen, we blame God. No. They didn't know that in a few moments, Lazarus will come back from the dead. They didn't know that. And we don't know when tragedy happens, when death happens, 
we don't know what God's plans will be. But he's working behind the scenes. He's working behind the scenes. Actually, for me, the last, see my father, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, first wife, all passed. But all of that has to do, in the end, it brought me here to Taiwan. Never in my wildest dreams I would have thought I would be in Taiwan. And then I get to meet all of you. A blessing. I get to be married to Susan. A blessing. And so all these things, God has been working behind the scenes. Okay, verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Barley harvest. Oh, by the way, um, Ruth in the Jewish tradition, they read the book of Ruth um, during Pentecost, during the gathering of the harvest because of this. Um, they came during the barley harvest and and Ruth has, uh, you know, has to do with gleaning, harvesting. So the Jewish tradition is that they read the book of Ruth um, during Pentecost, during the, the harvest season. Okay, chapter two. Then a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. So this is Boaz's family, part of his family. Very rich guy. So. Uh, by the way, uh, a rel relative here means kinsman. Uh, in fact, it's um, a close relative would be like a kinsman redeemer, and we'll explain that as we go. So Ruth the Moabitess, Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. So Ruth wanted to work, wanted to help the family out. They don't have any money. She, has, she wants to go get food and work. And Naomi said to her, go my daughter. Verse 3, then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. You know, this gleaning um, after the reapers, there's a law, it's called the welfare law, and it's, um, you guys can read it yourself, and when you get, you know, uh, Deuteronomy 24, 19, that area where, you know, when they harvest, stuff will fall. And you're not gonna harvest 100%. The law is that let it fall. So people who are poor or visitors or strangers, they can come in after and pick up the food. So it's kind of a welfare program to help the poor. And so, and it has to do with grapes, it has to do with fruit, it has to do with all these things. And they, whatever falls down, and you can't, you can't actually go do it twice. It's just whatever falls, leave it there. So that's, it's a good law to help the poor, right? So, um, and then the verse three says, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz and was of oh, the family of Elimelech. You know, when the Bible said, and, it ha and she happened, or by coincidence, in God's economy for our life, there's really no such thing as coincidences. And there's no such thing as just by chance. God is sovereign. He knows. It's not like we're, we're not robots. He knows what's gonna happen. And he understands. And I guess the better term is he naturally guides us as we walk with him. So you all know the verse the, in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You guys all know the, those, those verses. So as we walk with the Lord, as our heart are abiding with God, and it's just this natural process of just walking with him, and then he will direct our path. He will naturally direct our path. He won't just say, oh, turn right, turn. No, he just naturally does it. 
But you hear me say this, and I say this pretty much every week. But if we choose not to abide with the Lord, if we choose just to walk away, He's going to allow us to do it. But that means we're not trusting the Lord, right? So He's not going to direct our path. I would rather have God direct my path than not, than me trying to figure things out. Ruth had this heart. Your God will be my God. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you die, I will die. She, she saw in Naomi's family how they trusted God. And she wanted to follow that God. And now she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Very interesting. Verse 4, And now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. you know, I mean, does this happen today? The boss comes, The Lord be with you. And the worker says, The Lord bless you. Would that be great if that happens today? You know, the, the managers or the boss, the big boss, or your company's boss comes, hey, the Lord, uh, be, the Lord be, be, uh, be with you. I mean, that would be wonderful if that was happening today. But this is who Boaz was. He blesses his people who work for him. And he, he, he and then his, their workers, the workers were very happy, blessed him back. Very cool. Verse five, then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers. Whose young woman is this? And actually, this is New King James. And um, is that what this actually is saying? Is that who's that beautiful girl over there? <laughs> that beautiful young girl over there. The, uh, Boaz was a little was older. And, and he said, whoa. Ruth's name means what? Beauty, right? must have been very beautiful. Verse 5, Then Boaz said his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Verse 7, And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field where they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessel and drink from the young men, uh, from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes? Why me? Why? I mean, out of all these people, why, why me? That you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner. Verse 11. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth. And you have come to a people whom you did not know before. That the Lord, and I love this verse, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Wow, what a beautiful verse. The Lord repay your work and a full reward. Boaz, listening to this, he's got a full report already. He did his uh, research on Ruth already. I mean, this guy, by doing all this, something's happening, right? I mean, anybody can see that. Verse 13, then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord. For you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like the one of your maidservants. Verse 14, Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Whoa, still spending time with her. Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. 
So she sat beside the reapers. He passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied, and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. The sheaves, they, they haven't been harvested yet. And do not reproach her. So he said, hey, give her a break. Give, give her extra. And let her do, even harvest the ones uh, glean, even the ones that we haven't even gone to yet. Let her do it. And don't get mad at her. Verse 16, and let the grain from the bundles fall purposely to for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Hey, let's just, you know, push some down some of the, some of the stuff that we already gleaned and let her have it. Boy, he really liked her, right? I mean, you, you don't do this for anybody who you don't like. Verse 17, she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Um, that's a bushel. A bushel. Uh, it's around 64 U.S. pints, uh, which is a lot, or around almost 36 liters. That's a lot of stuff. And then she took it and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had cleaned. So she brought out and gave her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where have, you been where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. She saw all that and said, where did you go? Where did you get all this? I mean, this is incredible. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I have worked today is Boaz. Then verse 20, then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. He is a kinsman redeemer. He's a close relative. You know, there's a, there's a law in the, the Jewish law that there are certain um, assets that a close relative can redeem, can get back. One of them is if you're very poor and you have to sell a house or, or like mortgage a house, you have actually one year to get it back, pay back in full, or you can never get it back. But if it's a field, if it's land, if it's a field, if you sell it, Every 50 years, there's, it's called a jubilee that they have to give it back. But, be, but if you want to have it back before, your close relative, based on the agreed upon price, and based on how many years that's left on the contract, up to the 50th year, they can redeem it, buy it back, purchase it back. Or you can sell yourself as a slave. You get released every seven years. But if you want to come back earlier, and if you have a relative, a kinsman redeemer, a close relative, they can come and buy, redeem you, purchase you back, so you can have your freedom before the seventh year, based on an agreed upon price. And so, by Jewish law, as I said earlier, if the man dies, and his wife doesn't have any children, no sons, then the second, third, the kinsman redeemer needs to come and, and take care of the, the widow, the widow. And there's land involved, there's all these things that's involved. They can redeem it based on a price. Okay, and then, so, um, verse 33, and she stayed close to the young woman of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. So they did be doing this for a little bit. Verse, chapter 3, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that you may be well with you? Hey, shall I not help, help you find a husband, that you may have a future, a security? So you think about it. Mother-in-law must have been thinking about this for a while. Well, why would she approach Ruth about this? 
And then she said, Now Boaz, whose young women you have were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put per perfume on, and put on your best garments, put on your best dress, and go down to the threshing floor, and do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and he shall go in, uncover his feet, lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And he and she said to her, All that you do, all that you say to me, I will do. I mean, relationship between mother in law and daughter in law. Remember, before they even came back, there was love and respect there already. But right now, the mother-in-law was thinking about how she could help her daughter-in-law. How did Naomi know that Boaz was going to be where, where, at what time? It means that she was thinking this through. She was planning this out. She wants to help. She wants to help her daughter-in-law. And she's thinking about all this. And she, and she said, he's one of our kings. Uh, he's one of our, our, our kinsmen redeemers. He's the one who can help us and redeem you and marry you. Verse 6, and she went down to the threshing floor and did according to what, to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. You know, this all, when we hear God's word, when we read God's word, there are certain, sometimes we just kind of pick and choose what to do. But all means all. We need to follow the Lord with our whole heart, soul, and mind. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was cheerful, and he went lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly and covered his feet and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? Okay, it makes sense, right? I mean, you're, you, you just ate and drank, and then he was, fell asleep. And then, you know, Naomi, uh, uh, Ruth snuck in and uncovered his feet and slept at the feet there. And then at midnight, he kind of woke up, and then he thinks something's going on, and then saw that there's a woman laying there. So... And he was startled. Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wings, for you are a kinsman redeemer. It's a close relative. You know, close relative. This, again, if you go to, um, uh, the, to Deuteronomy 25, around 25.5, you can read all about how this whole works, but it's basically, again, the second, the third, the close relative would marry the, the widow and have a baby boy, and then the lineage will continue. It's basically to keep the family together, keep the inheritance together. So what Ruth was saying was, she was proposing. She was proposing marriage. She's saying, you're a close relative. And this is what, what kind of, what, this is how I know that Boaz was thinking about all of this. He was excited about this. Verse 10, then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, <laughs> my daughter. I mean, if you see a girl sitting there and then in the middle of the night, I may be scared to death. I'm like, what's going on, right? But he said, blessed are you. And uh, of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, how did he know all this? He's, he's been thinking this through too, right? And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. All the people of the town know. How does he know? Because he's been talking, checking her out, and checking out her reputation. Verse 12, now it is true that I am a close relative 
kinsman. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative of a kinsman for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she rose from one before one could recognize another. Then she said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also she said, Bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And she, when she held it, she, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. And, it, and she went into the city. When, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, The six ephah of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Boaz knows what he's doing. The, you know, he wants to make sure the mother-in-law is happy too. Verse 18, then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter today. You know, it's um, Ruth did what Naomi told her to do. Everything. And Naomi, you know, she knows that for Ruth to be, to know Boaz and all this was going to be good. And she realized that, you know, this could be uh, the Lord's blessing. And then Boaz, and when Ruth happens to be in Boaz's field, I mean, this is, this is what we call trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You know you always acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. God is working behind the scenes. And then she, Ruth knew that Boaz is gonna take care of this before the end of the day. He's gonna take care of it. Okay, now Boaz, verse one of four, now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, and close, the close relative of whom Boaz has spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. Hey, come on over here, let's talk. And he came aside and sat down, and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to her brother, Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. So Boaz was actually very, I mean, he was an honorable man. He said, you're the closest relative. You go buy the land. Uh, redeem it for its Elimelech. Redeem it. But if you won't do it, I'll do it, right? And this close relative said, I will redeem it. I'm wondering what Boaz is thinking now. <laughs> He's like, oh. And then, then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Remember this is how it goes. You have to perpetuate, you know, and, and, and make sure there's posterity. There's gonna be kids. And verse six, and the close relative said, no, 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 I cannot redeem it for myself. I mean, my wife's gonna kill me if I go marry, uh, if I go marry Ruth and, and I'll ruin my own inheritance, meaning that I'm gonna have a messy family and ruin all this inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. You go do it. I can't do it. I'm wondering what Boaz is thinking now. You know, he was like, boom, and then it went, went straight back up. And then, now, it was the custom in the former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. That's their tradition. That's how they do business deal. You take off your sandal, give it to the other person. 
We don't do that today. We throw that now. I'm just joking. Verse 8. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that have brought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Ch Chilion's and Mahomes from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, I have acquired as my wife to, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. Remember, Rachel and Leah were um, Jacob's wife, right? And this is where the tribe of Judah, all the tribes came from. So Rachel and Leah, all the tribes came from, from these guys. And then, um, and of course, they're, they're concubines. And the two who built the house of, the, of Israel, and may you prosper in Epapha and be famous in Bethlehem. So they pronounce a blessing. Verse 12, may your house be like the house of, whoa, guess what? Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Remember, Judah and Tamar. Tamar didn't have any husband, right? They, they all died. Two of them died. They had a son. And Perez, same situation. Ruth lost her husband. Now the kinsman redeemer came. And now they're going to have a son. And you know, when I say God's working in the back, in the behind the scenes, how would, I mean, in the beginning, we would even be able to see that God was planning for, for the lineage of who? Of Jesus Christ. We're going to see it here, all the way back to Judah and Tamar. That sad story, they're going to be part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. So let's close. I got one minute. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception. She bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel and may he be your restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Daughters are good, right? Daughters are, I mean, I, I, I don't buy this, just have, you know, Ruth is better than seven sons, which is, um, uh, I, I, love, I love this portion. And think about how much, man, I gotta go. Think about how much God loves Naomi. She was bitter, but now she has a son, a grandson, and in her in her life she gets to hold and, and nurse. She became the nanny for her grandson. And then Naomi, verse sixteen, took the child and laid him on her bosom and be, and became a nurse to him. And the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, "There is a son born to Naomi," and they called his name Obed. And he is the father of Jesse the father of David. Obed is the grandfather of King David from Boaz, from Ruth, the Moabitess, who came from, not an Israeli, he came, I mean, amazing. God is still working behind the scenes. Now, this is the gene genealogy of Perez. Remember, Tamar and Judah? Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, Jesse begot David. And if we go to Matthew, Matthew, 
uh, in the beginning of Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph, it has Ruth and Boaz in there. Ruth's name is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Amazing. And this is how God loves us. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. When we talk about redeeming in the New Testament, it always relates to the blood of Jesus. He came, paid the price for our sins with his blood. He redeemed us to his family. A beautiful story. I could go on for hours, but we'll have to stop here because I always try to stop around 8 o'clock. So let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. And, and Lord, it's so rich. It's so powerful. And there's so much lessons to be learned from your word. You know, this is not just, you know, sometimes we, we just study for history or we study for a knowledge. But your word has applications to life. And your word changes lives. It's not just for knowledge. It's not just to get a, to write a paper, but it's for life. And it's a story of you redeemed us so we can come back to you. Thank you, Lord. Be with your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming, guys.